Okay, good. Okay, so, like I was saying, um, we are going to go over Chapter 19 today uh, and do a review. If you have any questions on Chapter 17 or 18, uh, we'll go over those. And then, basically, next week, next Monday, will be the exam. Um, again, there's two ways. Not sure exactly how we're going to do it. Either it's going to be through D2L, where you just have questions and you, and, and you click it in. Depends if I have time in order to make that. Um, D2L is not very easy to actually make exams in. It takes a lot of time. Um, so uh, what I might just do is I might just upload the hard copy of the exam and you just write your answers on a scratch piece of paper and then you scan it and you upload it. Was everybody able to upload their exams? I know I got a few people um, who posted their stuff. If you haven't done that yet, um, please upload it to this area. If you go under activities, under assignments, all right, and then uh, I have it currently under practice. Um, you can see all the people who did it. So Tessa Savell. Um, so looks like I got most of them. Um, Lauren, I haven't gotten yours. So if you can just practice uploading anything, it doesn't matter what it is, just so that I know that you can do it. Um, so please uh, do that. I think everybody, did everybody else do it. Ian, I don't see one. Oh yeah, Ian, I see you. And then Isabel, and then. Jonathan, Sophia Marie. So if you guys can do that, just so that I know that you can upload it. So basically what you would do is I would upload the exam and on a scratch piece of paper, or on a piece of paper, just write your answer, which uh, it's going to be all multiple choice. Just write your answer and then scan it up uh, online uh, in, in this box. I'll actually make a folder. Actually, I'll do it right now as we speak. I'm going to create a folder. Uh, called exam number two, and that's where you will upload everything into. All right, and I will activate that next Monday when we're supposed to have class. What I am going to do is I do want you still to log in. Um, if you have a camera, I do want you to have the camera on you as well as your speaker open. Um, you don't have to have the volume up. You can turn the volume down, but I want your speaker to actually be on. Um, our administration said that, that we want to try to keep um, academic honesty uh, as honest as possible. So uh, in order to do that, while you take your exam, have your camera on you open and also have your microphone open as well. Again, you can turn down your volume so that you don't hear all the background noise. Um, if you don't have a camera, let me know. We can try to figure something out. Um, but that's how we'll do the exam too. Basically, you'll just either like take it online or, like I said, I'll, you, you'll download the exam or you can have it on your screen and then you can just write your answers on this fresh piece of paper. Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. Okay, good. Yeah. Yep. So we'll like meet on here? Yes. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. So next Monday we'll meet here exactly how we did, and then I will upload the exam as this, as if I'm passing it out. Um, so we'll try to keep it as as much as like what we would really do in the exam. So I'll basically activate it, um, and then you can go ahead and you download it on your computer, and then you take it and then upload it back on here in exam two, and that's pretty much how we'll do the exam. Okay. And do you still just have the, like, the cheat sheet? Or you yeah, you, you can have everything. Just don't use the computer, like the search stuff. You can use your book or your notes or your slides or anything like that. Just don't use in Google or stuff like that. That's the only thing I ask. Um, it's hard for me to check to see if you're using Google. Obviously, I'm, I'm going to be watching you guys. Um, it's more just to make sure that you don't have anybody in the room with you or anybody who's telling you the, the answers. That's more um, what it's for. Uh, but yeah, I'll let you guys use your book and notes and, and stuff like that. Okay, it's more, I mean, at this point, it's more for learning, just making sure that you g get the information and understand it and are able to answer the questions. Okay. Does that sound good? You oh, eat? Good. Okay, good. What, what, was there a question? Or I think that was, was that Tess that said something? I think you just said yes. I was just saying it sounds good. Okay, good, perfect. 
Okay, and like I said, um, it'll either just be a hard copy, which I'll post, or if I have time, I'll actually make it in D2L. So at that point, then on the computer, all, all you press is your A, B, or C, your choice. That obviously would be a lot easier um, because uh, at that point, it's auto-graded. So as soon as you hit submit, it gives you a grade and it's done. It goes into the grade book. <coughs> but the amount of time, like I was saying, in order to do that uh, takes quite a bit of time in order to put it in there. It might be quicker for me just to have a paper copy. So I'll see it, you know, in the next week um, because I have a um, two more. I have an, I, I have two exams I have to give tomorrow, so I have to grade those and stuff like that. So we'll see. But either way, meet here next Monday at ten o'clock and be expecting an exam. And again, that's on 17, 18, and 19. All right, let's go to the syllabus just to kind of... Um, and then next week, we will go over... Uh, no, yeah, yeah. So so the exam is only two weeks. So we get two... Uh, it's two weeks. <laughs> it's two hours. So the class is three hours. Uh, you only get two hours for the exam. The last hour, I am going to go over Chapter 20. So you still have to kind of watch about carbohydrates and kind of learn about that because next week we'll have the exam for the first two hours and then the last hour we're going to go over chapter 20 so that we stay on schedule because you have an exam uh that can't be right that exam can't be oh yeah that's the exam yeah here's the other exam right i guess it's yeah i have it marked wrong it should be go over no lab, you over chapter 22 in review. Your exam should be here on the 15th. Exam 3. Oh, that's exam 4. I'm going to have to figure out how I... I don't know why this is uh, off a little bit. I'll have to figure this out. Oh, I'm sorry, exam 3. That should be exam... Yeah, that's supposed to be exam 3. I'm sorry, guys. I thought 2 sounded wrong. Exam three. All right, now it makes sense. Okay. And then exam four is right here. So next week we'll do 20, the week after 21, and the week after 20, uh, 22, and a review, and then we'll have the exam. All right, let me just get things lined up here. All right. All right, anything else before we go over review lipids? Nope. Okay, good. Um, can somebody do me a favor and just text Chuck? Um, Isabel, I think you have his text, uh, his number, is that correct? Yeah, I have his number. Let me text him. Okay, yeah, just yeah, yeah. just text him real quick. To see if he's having issues again, or if he forgot that we had okay. class. I just want to make sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll let her do that, and then I'll start. Okay, and then if you have questions uh, about anything in the lecture, just. Interrupt me. That's no problem. You can just go off mic and interrupt me. Um, or if you want to type it in the chat, I do have the chat room uh, up uh, in the corner here. So if you have a question, I'll see it. So if you just want to, if you just want to type it in, that's fine. Um, and then I'm going to go in screen mode. There we go. You guys probably see that line across here. That's just the recorder. It's recording everything. And then I have this new handy dandy tool that I can actually draw with a lot easier than using the mouse. It's not much better <laughs> as far as my drawing, but at least it's an angry stuff like that. It's, actual, it's an actual pen, so it actually it works a little bit better. Okay, so <clears throat> let's get this. So section, so this chapter is about fat. So we're basically going through all of the biomolecules uh, in biochemistry, so the biomolecules. So there are fats and lipids, there are proteins, amino acids make up proteins, and then the nucleic acids, so the other biomolecules. Um, so uh, that's basically what we're going to be talking about now in the next few chapters. So the first part is lipids. This is the first um, uh, 
biomolecule that we'll learn about. I think we've learned about these quite a bit, especially triglycerides. Um, so we will talk about those. Uh, one second, let me see. Okay, so the thing about lipids is it's it's the fat inside of our body. Um, it's insoluble in water because it's made of a bunch of carbons and hydrogens. It's all basically hydrocarbons. So we know that carbon hydrogen is nonpolar because of the fact that uh, hydrogen and carbon are equal in their electronegativities. Therefore, you don't have a, a polarized bond. Um, there. Physical properties, they're defined by a physical property and not by the presence of a particular functional group. Um, a lot of these fats do have alcohols on them and esters and aldehydes and things like that. But there's much more of the carbon and hydrogen on the molecule than there is of the functional group. So um, the fact that you have a, it's basically a big thing of hydrocarbons makes it um, nonpolar and as a fat. And like I said, they contain nonpolar carbon, carbon, and carbon hydrogens few polar bonds, water insoluble. Um, there are uh, technically two types of fats. The one is hydrolyzable liquids, meaning that you can break it apart with water into smaller fragments. And then you have non-hydrolyzable uh, lipids, meaning that they do not cleave. They basically are one big massive molecule. Okay, the uh, hydrolyzable ones are the ones that we talked about, the triglycerides, the this triacyl Glycerol, remember, is another name for triglycerides. So I think I've told you, I've never really heard it called this before, except in this book. This is usually what people call it, a triglyceride. So we'll talk about waxes, which are very similar to triglycerides. Um, and then the phospholipids, uh, which we'll talk quite a bit about, that has to do with cells and the cell membrane is what's called a phospholipid. It's basically a fat. Anytime you see lipid, that means fat molecule with a phosphate group on it. And then the non-hydrolyzable ones, you have steroids and you have vitamins and um, uh, uh, I, I, I can never, never even pronounce that. Icosinoids? Icosinoids, I believe is how you pronounce it. The icosinoids we'll talk about as well. Um, all right, so first we'll talk about the hydrolyzable ones. All right, um, these are derived from fatty acids. So when you hear the term fatty acid, which we talked about, I think, before the break, we also talked, I think, a little bit about it last week. Fatty acid is basically something that has a carboxylic acid group on it. We make these group of carbons as a carboxylic acid. And then you have a big chain of... Uh, non-polar groups, basically carbons attached to carbons that have hydrogens on them. Basically very non-polar. So non-polar tail, you can call that a tail, with a little bit of a polar head. Okay, however, I would not really consider this molecule very polar because remember we talked about for every hydrogen bond, if you have anything more than four to five carbons, uh, basically it's non-polar. All right, and these usually will have somewhere between 12 to like 20 uh, carbons long. Okay, so basically these hydrolyzable ones are these carboxylic acid groups or have a, um, a fatty acid. Basically this group is attached onto something and, and it, it forms an ester functional group and then what makes them hydrolyzable is that when you hydrolyze the ester you form the carboxylic acid. All right, so naturally occurring fatty acids have even number of carbons. So, you know, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. They can either be called saturated or unsaturated. Saturated means everything is a single bond. All the carbons are single bonds. Mostly those are found in animal products, uh, lard, uh, in steaks, and things like that. All that white, uh, waxy stuff is usually are all saturated. The unsaturated are, are usually found in um, uh, in vegetables or 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 it's found in a non-animal product um, so and it's usually cis these are usually cis molecules so you, you'll have your chain plus a double bond which will be cis and then it'll be something like that the trans fatty acids that you've heard about which are not good for you 
are usually made in the laboratory. What happens is cis molecules are not that stable. And if you heat them up a little bit, they actually, this group will, will actually go on the op opposite side and form a trans molecule. So if you try to partially hydrogenate fats, um, or if you take the fat and heat it up in some way, it usually converts into the trans acid. So this is not naturally occurring, not natural. All right, it's the cis molecules that are naturally occurring. All right, uh, as the number of double bonds in fatty acids increase, the melting point decreases. All right, so I think we talked a little bit about this. When you have trans, they're able to pack on top of themselves, on, uh, on top of themselves, or if it's saturated. So saturated or trans, let me write it up here. Saturated or trans are able to actually pack on top of themselves very well. So these are usually more solids at room temperature, where the cis molecule is kind of uh, it has like a kink in it. So you're going this way, you have a double bond and a kink. Um, and then if you have a, uh, so anyway, uh, here, let me go back here. I'm saturated because they're all like this. I can have one fat and then another one that kind of stacks on top of another one and stacks on top of another one. So it's very dense. Where in the cis molecule, uh, if we have all the cis, they can't really stack on top of each other. So because of that, they're usually oils at room temperature. So like olive oil or vegetable oil, um, any type of those oils, uh, it's because they have cis, where if you have uh, lard, um, you know, or something that's a solid at room temperature, it's because you have more of the saturated molecules or trans of fatty acids in, in butter, uh, things like that. But the more cis you have, it's more of an oil at room temperature because it can't pack on top of each other. It's not as dense. All right, uh, two of the common uh, fatty acids are stearic acid and oleic acid. We'll also talk about linoleic acid, um, which is also a common one. Um, uh, here, they just kind of, so stearic acid is a fatty acid. Um, there are 18 carbons in that one. Um, I think oleic acid also has 18, is that right? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 13. Yeah, it also has 18, so it's like stearic acid, except you have a, a double bond right in the middle of it, a cis a, a double bond, and you can see how drastic of a temperature these two melting points are. Just by putting in a double bond, all right, I have the same number of carbons and stuff, except I have a cis, but this can't all pack on top of itself, so the melting point is at 16 degrees Celsius. Room temperature is somewhere about 25 degrees Celsius. So at room temperature, this is an oil. At room temperature, this is a solid. All right, so you would actually have to take this and heat it up a little bit in order to melt it. So there's a good example of that. And here's just a list of common ones. I'm not going to, you know, really ask you, um, like, the names of them or anything like that. But this just kind of gives you a list of the common ones uh, between 10 and 18 uh, of the carbons of the fatty acids. So here you can see steric acid and palmitic acid, lauric acid. These are kind of common ones. Here's the linoleic acid, and the, the linolenic and the linoleic. Oleic, so these are the common um, uh, cis fatty acids, or unsaturated, mostly found in oils, olive oil and vegetable oil, stuff like that. All right, um, I don't know why that came backwards. So here's l l l linoleic and linolenic acid. These are what's called omega-3 or omega-6 acids. You guys have probably heard about those, and I think I mentioned this in class a while ago. The reason it gets this omega-3, everyone's heard of, or omega-9, you guys might have heard of an omega-9, or omega-369. Um, basically, that means if you start at this carbon, so not starting at the carboxylic acid end, starting at the, at the very end of the chain, if you count in, if your double bond starts on carbon three, it's called a omega-3 acid. If your double bond starts on carbon six, it's called an omega-6. Uh, this carbon right here is not, so this is actually called an omega-369 is how some people call it, or you can call it an omega-3. So omega-369, because I have a double bond at carbon three, this is four or five, that's carbon six, seven, eight, nine. That is carbon nine. Usually, you'll have a double bond at 9, 
And then um, it depends on if you have one at six or you have one at three. So it's basically if you have one at three, you also have it at six and nine. If you have one at six, but not at three, you'll also have it at nine. If you don't have one at six, you will have it at nine. So you either have a three, six, nine, or a six, nine, or a nine. Um, that's usually uh, how they exist in nature. Um, so that's why people just say omega six, that's assumed you also have the nine. If they say omega three, that's assumed you also have the, have the six and the nine. So that's why it's kind of redundant to say omega three, six, nine. You just say omega three, and that's implied it's also a three, six, and a nine. But there are some people who say more than that. Okay. All right. Um, so any questions on the fatty acids? Just kind of the name, the structure. Just basically carboxylic acid with, with a bunch of carbons on the end. And you can either have a double bond or single bonds. Saturated, unsaturated. Okay, good. Uh, waxes uh, is basically also a fatty acid, but it, it's in the form of an ester. So remember, an ester is where you have uh, have carbons and hydrogens, carbonyl, oxygen, and then you have more of the carbons and hydrogens. But what but what makes a wax is that this part of it is a lot of carbon. So again, somewhere between ten to twenty carbons long, and this part of it, the same thing, is also somewhere between ten to twenty carbons long. So basically, it's just this long, gigantic chain of carbons and hydrogens with a little ester group right in the middle of it, all right? So yes, I have a polar group, a little bit of a polar group, but I have so many carbons. You know, we'll have something that's 20 to 40 carbons long, and so all, all carbons and hydrogens. So that's what m makes up a wax. It's composed of a fatty acid, all right? So imagine I've got, you know, 18 carbons here, and then I have an alcohol where this R group is also 18 carbons long. All right, you notice I'm taking an acid and an alcohol and making an ester. Do you guys remember what the name of this reaction is? Uh, especially since I think it's in chapter 17. Do you guys remember the name of this reaction? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Fischer esterification. Yes, very good. Very good job. This is a Fischer esterification reaction. Esterification. Um, usually, you do this in the presence of acid and you heat it. So, very good. All right, so that's what they're showing you right here. All right, um, here's just an example of uh, a common wax um, where you have 15, I guess, 16 carbons here, and you get another 16 carbons here. All right, and it, it's completely all saturated. Everything is saturated. There is no unsaturated parts to it. Um, and it's a wax that's found in sperm whales, in their fat. All right, so because of the long nonpolar uh, chains, the waxes are very hydrophobic, which we obviously know because it's all carbons and hydrogen, very nonpolar. They form a protective coating on birds' feathers and sheep's wool that make up beeswax. So this is the structure of beeswax. Interesting. Do you like example? All right. Uh, like other esters, these are hydrolyzed. So if you have an ester, if you take water and acid, you can you, you can cleave that and break it up back into its components. So if you look at this re reaction here, it's basically the reverse of this reaction. Let me get uh, an eraser real quick. Let me erase all this. Let me get. You guys can't see this, but the chat's in the way. Okay. If you look at the reverse reaction, notice it's... Um, so if I take an ester and add water to it, an acid, and I go this direction, I'm hydrolyzing. I'm taking that part off. So this OR becomes this, H-O-R. And then this part of it has the carbonyl, gets the OH group to become a carboxylic acid. So that's hydrolysis. And hydrolyze. Anytime that you take a molecule and you break it apart with water, it's called hydrolysis or hydrolyze. All right. Um, so that's what, what they're showing you here. That's why these are called um, uh, hydrolyzable fats. All right. Because we can break them apart with, with water. And then you can break it apart into its fatty acid and its alcohol. 
right? Triglycerides are basically like a wax, except we have three of them, hence the name triglycerides. So we talked about that the basic structure is a glycerol molecule. Remember, glycerol is a tri-alcohol, meaning it has three OH groups. Tri as in three. Oh, that should be a carbon with an OH, and then you have hydrogens here. So this is glycerol, or glycerin. Right? And then you have your, your fatty acid, which we talked about, like steric or linoleic or oleic, basically some long chain. And basically you're doing a Fischer esterification on this carboxylic acid and this alcohol, except you, you do it three times. So you do it here and you do it here. All right, so here's an example. Here is glycerol or glycerin. Uh, it's the same thing. And then whatever your fatty acids are, these R groups, they could be all the same. They could be all different. Two of them could be the same. One could be different. It's not really important. And then when you do the Fischer esterification, so this is the, I'll, I'll call it FE for Fischer esterification, you form the triester group, which we call a triglyceride. Your book calls it, again, a triacylglyceride, which is the same as a triglyceride. So make sure that you know both names um, because they will be used all throughout. Okay, so a simple triglyceride have three identical fatty acid side chains. All right, so working through, so this one has, has 16 carbons to it. Here's a mixed where you have one that's not the same, but they're all different. All right, saturated uh, triacylglycerides contain only saturated fatty acids. We said saturated. They're mostly in animal fats and our solids are in temperature because, again, they're able to stack on top of each other. Unsaturated are usually, again, are basically vegetable oils are liquids. They're usually the cis form, like a three omega, a six omega, nine omega. Um, you can either have monounsaturated. That means one of the carbons is a double bond. So like in a, a, a nine omega or omega nine, where you only have one of the double bonds. Or polyunsaturated, where you have m m multiple carbons have a double bond. So like a three, six, nine, or a six, nine, or something like that. Increase the number of double bonds in the fatty acid chain, decrease the melting point. So the more double bonds you have, the more likely it's going to be an oil. So if you have a 369, that's oil. A 9 can be. I guess it depends on how long the, the chains are. But usually if you only have one double bond, most likely it's an oil. But it could be on the verge of being an oil and a liquid. All right. Uh, so I think they're just giving an example of an unsaturated triglyceride. Some features, fats uh, have higher melting points. Uh, they are solids at room temperatures. Fats are derived from fatty acids. I think this is just kind of a review. Oils have lower melting points. Again, fats are the saturated. Oils are the unsaturated. Oils are derived from fatty acids having longer number of double bonds. So just exactly what we said. Um, I have a question, Steve. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, so what's the result? Of the uh, Fischer esterification of triglycerols. What's the result? Yeah, yeah, we you talked about it just like a bit earlier. It was like. So a Fischer um, esterification is if you take a carboxylic acid and you add an alcohol to it. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that. I just don't okay. know what. Uh, I see the name of the uh, of what triglycerols who are put through Fischer esterification turn into. Oh, a, a triglyceride. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. yeah, up here, let's go back to that screen. So here, so this uh, is, well, so again, it's either a, tri see how they have triglyceride or they call it triacyl glycerol. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah, it's a few words. Right. I've actually got a quick question too. Sure. Um, can waxes be saturated or unsaturated? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Got um, it. Yeah, but I believe that they're mostly saturated just because they are are solids uh, at room temperature. Um, I don't know what a, a liquid wax <laughs> would be considered, but I, I think they're mostly sa sa saturated. Okay. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. All right. Uh, here are just this is kind of interesting just to kind of see what percent of these types of fats are made up of saturated or unsaturated. Um, so lard, um, you can see, is mostly in between the, the, the saturated and a monosaturated. So what is that? 83% of it is a saturated, unsaturated. And, and butter is mostly saturated. 
Um, sh shortening um, is kind of a, I don't know if you guys ever had like crystal sh shortening. It's kind of almost, almost on the verge of a liquid, and that, that's because you have quite a bit of the, of the poly unsaturated, but you have a lot of the trans. Um, and then the oils, um, you can see mostly very low amounts of the saturated, with the exception of coconut oil, which is a solid, um, but it melts at a very low temperature. And the, the reason is because these carbon chains are somewhere between six to eight carbons, um, or nine, somewhere around there. Um, it's what's called an MCT, if you guys have heard this term, which stands for medium chain, oh, chain triglyceride. So MCT, MCT, so a medium chain size. So rather than a big chain size, which we talked about is between like a 12 and 20, MCTs are lower than the 12. Um, so it's called an MCT, so it's a medium chain. Um, so the fatty acids on there are smaller chains or somewhere between six to eight. So, so because of that, even though they are saturated, so in coconut oil um, and and I, th I think palm oil as well. Um, they uh, are mostly saturated, but their carbon chains are very small. So now, even though they're unsaturated, um, because the chains are smaller, they are more on the verge of being an oil. Um, except for in coconut, because it's so saturated, it's actually, it's more of a solid. It's, it it kind of resembles lard a little bit, but it, it melts pretty quickly, but it has shorter chains. Um, nowadays, they're saying that even though they're saturated, they aren't as bad for you because of the fact that the chains are smaller, our bodies are able to handle them, are able to break them down a lot better, where these, which are longer chains, um, our bodies can't really handle them that well, and they get stored in our liver as fat, where these are a little bit smaller and are able to pass through us a little bit easier. Uh, easier. Um, so uh, there's also a lot of research saying that these types of oils are beneficial. Um, <clears throat> uh, from a chemistry point of view, if you have a, a, a fatty liver, uh, the only way, that, so if you think about in chemistry, how do you, if you have a pan that's full of grease and fat, um, the only way in order to get rid of it, or let's not use that as an example, if you have a compound that's very nonpolar, how do you dissolve it? Do you use water that's polar, or are you going to use a solvent that's very nonpolar? Right? You're going to use a nonpolar solvent, right? Because nonpolar, uh, it dissolves nonpolar. Nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. So if you want to clean out fat from your liver, are you going to use water to do it, or do you think using another fat in order to do it? I know it kind of it, it goes against everything in our medical field that, that we've learned, but they're finding that these shorter uh, like chains of fat is actually cleaning up all the other fat, this type of fat that's stored inside a, of our liver. So you, you're going to use fat in order to clean out fat. So that's also one of the things that, that they think. I don't know how much evidence that they actually have of that, but they have been fa fa finding that these MCTs are actually are actually very helpful for us because we, we need fat in our diet, but we don't need a lot of the lard fat. We need more of the smaller chain fat, um, where it's doing uh, it's twofold. One, it's it, it's putting fat in our diets that we need for in order to make hormones um, and things like that. But also the smaller chains our bodies are able to handle. Plus, it's able to clean out any excess fat inside of our our liver and our bodies. Um, so there is a lot of research now uh, that's going on on these. Um, and then margarine and spreads, um, they have soybean oil and vegetable oil. Um, so those are more solids at, at room temperature um, because of a lot of the trans fats that we have in them. Okay, so any questions on that? Just kind of a breakdown. All right, this is just the focus on health and medicine of fats. Fats are used for our cell membranes to insulate 
uh, to store energy. <clears throat> it's recommended no more than 20 to 35% of a person's caloric intake from fats. Uh, a high, again, I think in the videos, I, I think I talk about, well, it, it depends on the diet you're on and what you want to believe. Um, if you believe that carbohydrate is the culprit for all of our medical issues or if you think it's the fat. Uh, so uh, that's kind of up for all debate, uh, up for debate, debate these days. Again, high intake of saturated fats. Again, is it really... I mean, I don't know how much you guys have, have watched on or, you know, I've seen all the documentaries and heard about all, all the diets the, uh, on the keto diet um, and, you know, all these high fat and protein diets. Everyone is losing weight and their cholesterol levels are great and, you know, all this stuff, whatever. I'm not here to debate that. Um, but <clears throat> again, is it the carbohydrate or the fats? But so we have to take all this now for a grain of salt. Um, saturated fats do s s stimulate the, the production of cholesterol, which actually is good. We actually do need cholesterol in our bodies. Um, obviously, that they're saying that if you have way too much of it, it builds up inside of our uh, arteries. So, again, it's a debate. Um, is that excess all due, due to the, the carbohydrate? I don't think this book even talks about it, but as far as what is happening in the news um, in nutrition uh it's a lot different than what this book is saying um and then the result high blood pressure heart attacks and strokes all right uh and then here's just kind of examples as to where you see these things so uh more of the saturated is more in our dairies like in ice cream cheese and butter and all the marbling and fat and fried foods and then more of the cis is more in um uh, in non-animal products, so in in, uh, in nuts and beans and vegetables, things like that. All right, here's trans fatty acids. Usually, so what's called a you know a hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated. What they would do is take a fat like this, which is a naturally occurring fat, and partially hydrogenate it. So add hydrogen. We learned about this in a previous chapter. But they don't add an excess amount of hydrogen to actually hydrogenate everything. What the hydrogen will do is on, will only hydrogenate one of the double bonds, but not them both. So it still keeps that double bond, but will hydrogenate one of them off. Um, but in, by doing this, I, I told you guys that in heating this, it will actually turn this cis double bond into a trans double bond. Um, so they're kind of showing you right here how it's a trans. So imagine if you took this molecule, partially hydrogenated off one of the double bonds, and then this turns into a trans in the process, and that's how you get a trans. And that's how you get a trans fatty acid. These are not naturally occurring molecules; these are synthesized. All right um, here we go. More unsaturated, lower the risk of heart disease and decrease level of cholesterol. Omega threes are very helpful in lowering the risk of heart attacks. The double bond is unsaturated, tri, uh, glycerol is trans, the beneficial, the, the beneficial effect is low. So just as we were saying, once it goes to trans, that's it. Our body sees this molecule as if it was a saturated molecule. It has to be cis, double bond, in order for our body to actually see it as a good fat. Once it goes trans, it's basically like a saturated fat at that point, even though I have a double bond there. Trans fats are probably synthesized instead of naturally occurring, act like saturated fats. There you go. It's exactly everything I just said. Okay, here's the hydrolysis of fatty acids. So this is what happens inside of our bodies once you eat something or if you have a lot of fat stored up. If you want to start breaking down the, the fat, what the first step is is to break down is to hydrolyze that group off and form the ester. I'm sorry, the acid and the and the tri alcohol. Again, this is called hydrolysis or or hy hydrolyzed. Um, the, all right, uh, the triglycerides are stored in our adipose tissue, adipose cells, and the surrounding organs for future use. Um, 
uh, this stuff I'm going to go about energy enzymes. Yeah, so the enzyme that the hydrolyzes it's called a lipase. That's the enzyme that's used to hydrolyze these fats. Uh, and then when we metabolize the fatty acid, it uh, you get a tremendous amount of energy and it breaks down into CO2 and water. Those are the byproducts. All right, here they're just kind of showing you more about that. Here's about soaps. Well, first, any questions about triglycerides, about what we just talked about? What are the soaps? I know that we talked about soaps before we left for spring break. All right, soaps are basically fatty acids, but with a very polarized head. This is very polar because it's ionic. Okay, so if you take a fatty acid, so remember, a fatty acid is called a fatty acid because it's a carboxylic acid with a very long chain. If you add a base to this, like sodium hydroxide, you cleave off this acidic loop and you make an ionic molecule, you form a negative charge. So this hydroxide grabs that hydrogen to form water, and then our sodium ion becomes the counter ion for that O negative. So you have very, very polar head and a very nonpolar tail. So it's kind of like the molecule is both. It's, it's what's called amphoteric. Amphoteric. Amphoteric in chemistry means it has both of the opposite characteristics. It's both polar and it's nonpolar. So like water, uh, I don't know if you've learned about this in your Gen Chem class. I teach it in my Gen Chem. Water is amphoteric because water has both an acid, has a proton on it, but it also has a hydroxide on it as well. So it's both an acid and a base. It acts as both. So we, we call water amphoteric. Um, from the Latin room amphibian, and amphibian can breathe on the water as well as outside of water, so that's where that amph comes from, um, amphoteric. So this is the same thing. It's polar and it's nonpolar, so we call it amphoteric. All right, so uh, the way you make soap is you take a uh, is you take fat, a triglyceride, add sodium hydroxide to it. It cleaves it to give you the glycerol and the our 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 um, our soap molecule, where we have the polar ionic head with a very nonpolar tail to it. <clears throat> All right, basically how it works is the nonpolar tail inserts itself into the grease because light dissolves like, and the polarized head stays outside of the oil or the fat. Um, and it, so therefore water now sees a very polarized molecule and is able to dissolve it. All right, so any questions? Uh, have you heard from Chuck Isavale? Has he said anything? I'm curious if you heard anything from him yet. No, I haven't heard anything. He hasn't responded. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Next part uh, is phospholipids. Uh, hold on one second. Phospholipids is like a triglyceride, right? Except one of the groups um, is a phosphate, a phosphate group. Okay, and there are two types. We have a phosphoacylglycerol or a phosphoglyceride, or a spingomyelin is what this is. Uh, and it's similar to a triglyceride. You still have a fatty acid and you have the phosphate, uh, but you have a different group here, which we will talk about how you can tell what kind of group it is. All right, these, uh, these types of molecules is the fat that's around our brain. Our brains have this kind of a, it's kind of a waxy material. Um, it's not really a soft, fatty material as what um, uh, we would refer to as fat. Uh, it's more of a, a harder, waxy material that is coded around our neurons, um, like the myelin sheath. You know, the myelin actually has the word in there. That's kind of where th this fat is found. It's more on our nerves and around our brain, uh, where this type of fat is actually found in our cell membranes. All right, so we'll kind of talk about both of those. All right, so the phospholipids, the name of it, phospholipid, has a phosphate group. So you have two of these fatty acids and then you have a phosphate group. Remember from Gen Chem, phosphate 
is a TO4 with a 3 minus charge on it. That's a phosphate group, um, so a phospholipid. So you, you have the fatty part of it, which is right here. And then this R group uh, is usually all different types, or sometimes it's not even there at all, and you have a negative charge. So again, polarized head, um, it, you, you'll see in the next slides, it looks like something like this. You have the two nonpolar parts, which is this part. And then this round part is kind of this part of it. It's the very polarized part, which usually will have a negative charge associated with it. All right, so here's kind of showing you some examples of one. Um, again, two nonpolars, and then you have a very polarized part of it. And it's very polarized because you have a negative charge and a positive charge. So you have ionic. Remember, anytime you have an ionic bond, that's very, very polar. It's incredibly polar. All right, and here's another example. These don't differ by much, I think by the methyl groups. Yeah, you can see here I've got the hydrogens. Here I don't have the hydrogens on the nitrogen anymore. So this can form a little bit more hydrogen bonding. This one cannot, but at this point, hydrogen bonding is not too big of a deal because we have ionic parts. So, I mean, we have ion, that, that pretty much outweighs everything at that point. So they kind of have a general drawing like this showing you a polar head with the two nonpolar uh, glyceride tails to it. Um, these are commonly used, so here it kind of shows it to you in full glory. These are, uh, and then here's an example of the um, uh, of the myelin, uh, where this is kind of our backbone. It's not really a glyceride at this point, but you can see you have this long chain of carbons. You have 12, 13, 14, 15 carbons there, but you don't have an ester group. Um, and then you have an amine and then an OH and then you'll have other things attached onto here. So this is kind of, if you see something like this, this is, uh, you know, it's uh, um, a myelin -like type of fat, a, 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 a spingomyelin type. And they do not contain esters, like I said, uh, they're single fatty acids bonded back on, but an amid bond. So you'll have an amid bond from that nitrogen. All right, so the, the fatty acid that you do have is not an ester, it's an amide, so nitrogen, carbonyl, and then you have that phosphate group like we saw uh, in, in the previous example. So here's an example of our myelin sheath that is around our nerves and our brain. So it's very similar, but, you know, that group is different, obviously, and then rather than having an ester group, you have an amide. And then if you have MS, multiple sclerosis, uh, it's basically what happens is your immune system it is attacking the myelin sheath. So it breaks down all the myelin on the nerve and you now have cross signals between the nerve. And it's basically the immune system is attacking uh, this compound. So that's what MS is. All right, cell membranes, just to kind of show you how these are used in cell membranes. Um, they have this, let's just go to the example. Uh, you have your nonpolar tails, very nonpolar. These nonpolar parts interact with other nonpolar parts. So you have all the nonpolar tails interacting. It's kind of like how soap works. So here I have grease and we have our nonpolar tails. Um, are, are inserting inside of it, and we have the, have the polar part that is all sticking outside. That's kind of what's happening. This area right here is all very nonpolar, NP, nonpolar, because outside of the cell, so here's the outside of the cell, here's the inside of the cell. Those areas are very polar. <clears throat> our, water, our bodies are mostly water, so inside of our cell has a lot of water. So if you take a, let's say here's a cell, Inside of here is a lot of water, and outside of here is a lot of water. So on the cell, you want to have it very polarized. I don't know why these lines keep forming. I don't know if I'm hitting a button or something, but if you see them, you just kind of ignore them. So outside of the cell, I'm sorry, uh, so here's our membrane. Um, outside of it is polar, inside of it is polar, but the membrane itself, the actual inside of the membrane is very nonpolar. So you have these two like all coming together, but the outside of this is, is very polar. So we have a bunch of minus and, and positive charges here. Same thing here, minus and plus. Um, so that's basically how the cell membrane works. 
All right, and then inside of the cell membrane, if you want to transfer things into it, you have to have these proteins. You have all types of proteins in there um, and, and stuff hanging off of it, like carbohydrates and things like that. Um, but it's basically in order to pass like, something on the outside into the inside, they have to go through these like, types of proteins that these get absorbed into and get transferred in and get shuttled in. All right, proteins and cholesterol molecules are embedded in the uh, in the lipid bilayer. Peripheral proteins are embedded w w within the uh, membrane that extend outward and in, in, uh, inside, like these things right here, w which help shuttle things through. Um, sometimes carbohydrates are attached if it's a glycolipid. Glycolipid, glyco meaning sugar, lipid meaning fat. Here, a glycoprotein meaning um, uh, uh, a protein of some sort, a carbohydrate and a protein. Um, small molecules are able to like, like to diffuse back and forth pretty easily, um, but if you have larger molecules, you have to use all those channels. Um, ions transfer based off of a gradient. If there's like too much of an ion outside or inside, it gets shoveled through. And so here is kind of a, a, a you know, a cut view of this, just to kind of show you simple diffusion. These are usually small, small molecules like water or CO2, just can kind of pass back and forth. <clears throat> but if you have l larger molecules, usually proteins or carbohydrates or things like that, you have to use a, um, a protein of some sort, of some sort, in order to pass through there. Okay, any questions? All right, well, why don't we take a quick break? Uh, we'll take about a 10 minute break, um, and then we'll come back. We will finish this up we'll, and we'll talk about the non hydrolyzable fats. All right? Any comments? Oh, here we go. John, let's see, Jonathan has a question. Hi, Steve, would you mind if I left? No, if you want to leave, that's totally fine. Um, if you guys feel all comfortable with the information, you don't have to stay. I'm just trying to make this as much as like a class as possible. Um, so if you guys want to leave, please feel free to leave. Sorry, John, I saw that. That was get a sound check. You just hit a Y. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> Cholesterol. All right. Okay, so cholesterol has this common structural characteristic to it. This six... Six 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 five ring system. If you see any type of a uh, a system l like that, <clears throat> it's called a steroid skeletal structure. Even though the structure might not be acting like a steroid, like uh, uh, cholesterol has a structure, but also our steroids are our hormones. All of our horm hormones um, have this type of a structure to them. It's just a, a changing of all the groups around it. If you have a double bond or if you have an aromatic ring at one place or if you have oxygen hanging off, it changes um, uh, the type of molecule it is. But um, we, we call it a steroid group um, <clears throat> uh, skeletal structure. Okay, um, So we're going to be looking at a lot of different uh, structures that uh, ha uh, have this kind of ring system to it. All right, uh, cholesterol. Is one of them. Um, it actually is a steroid uh, that is synthesized from our liver. Um, it's found all throughout our body. Um, it's very important that we actually have it in our body because it, again, it helps us make uh, hormones and um, uh, a bunch of other uh, other compounds. Um, it's mostly obtained from our diet. Um, elevated levels. So I'm going to have to go through all this. Cholesterol is insoluble, obviously, because it's. Um, Transfer the bloodstream through lipoproteins and phospholipid proteins. You have LDLs and HDLs. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's basically um, implying so the LDLs uh, transport cholesterol from the liver um, into our tissues, where the high density transport cholesterol from our tissues back into a level uh, liver. So the reason LDLs aren't as good is because it's going out. It means that we have a lot of it, and it's flooding our bodies, our tissue. Where the HDLs, it's being pulled back into our liver, uh, our liver, so it has a smaller amount inside of our tissues and our bodies. Um, so that's why it's important to have more of the HDLs than the LDLs. 
Um, this just gives you, I think, like a structure of, of the of the um, of a lipoprotein and how it looks with all the fat inside and the proteins inside of the of the cell walls. All right, so this just kind of talks about what LDLs do. They de they deposit the cholesterol in the cell walls. Because again, LDLs are going out into the body. So the higher LT the, the higher the LDLs, the more of it you have in your body. Um, <clears throat> the HDLs reduce the level of cholesterol overall because that brings the cholesterol out of the body back into the liver. So it's not in our arteries, it's not in our tissues, it's not throughout the body. And then there's some numbers over there. There's just a cross section of a healthy artery and one that has all the plaque inside of it. Uh, these are just statins, just drugs that are used to reduce the amount of cholesterol in our bloodstream. Uh, they act as blocking the synthesize of cholesterol at an early stage. So it so it blocks um, our body's ability to actually make cholesterol. A lot of side effects with those drugs. Um, now here's some uh, uh, um, hormones. Um, these help us. Uh, there are two classes. There are our sex hormones, and then there's the adrenal cortical uh, um, uh, steroids or hormones. Um, so here's just some like, common female hormones: estrogen and uh, progesterone is one, um, and then androgens for the male hormones. Um, here are just the common structures. Here's estradiol, um, which is you know is the uh, structure of uh, in, is uh, is a structure of one of the estrogens and estrone. So you can see these six 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 five. You can see how they have an aromatic ring. These have a common aromatic ring. They aren't much of a difference. Notice the name kind of tells you what functional group is on them. So this ends in all. You have an alcohol. This ends in own. This has a ketone. So there you go. Here's a progesterone uh, and testosterone and androsterone. Uh, not much of a difference except a double. Uh, this the oxidation is reversed. You have an alcohol here goes to a ketone and the double bond is, is gone. So notice they all have that again at six 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 five. Just all different groups: alcohols, carbonyls, double bonds. All right, um, anabolic steroids uh, for the promotion of muscle growth. There are you know obviously synthetic forms of it. Uh, they have the same effect as testo of of testosterone in the body. Um, uh, they're more stable, they're not metabolized as quickly, so um, a person that is injecting anabolic steroid, steroids always has a very high amount of steroids in their body, so their body is just constantly producing muscles. Um, and they, let's see, they've been used in bodybuilders, not in competition, I think you all know about this in the news, long news. Yeah, so it causes a lot of problems. Um, one of the main problems is, uh, I think we talked about this last chapter when we talked about um, like serotonin when uh, if you take a compound that constantly increases the amount of serotonin in your body you kind of get addicted to it um, and it's because it's overstimulating the active sites so your body has to make more active sites so if you stop the drug then, then your body is always wants more of it you have all these active sites that are hungry for it um, and you go through a withdrawal process and then your body starts to break down all those sites and you kind of get sensitized to it. Well in steroids actually the, 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 the same thing can happen. If you take anabolic steroids for a certain amount of time your body gets used to the fact of using of always having a large amount of steroid um, that if you stop it then your uh, your body basically stops producing the hormone on its own. Um, and it kind of gets relied upon that you're going to keep adding more to it. So if you don't use it, then your body all of a sudden doesn't make any um, uh, of those male hormones anymore. And your body now is lacking big time in, in male hormones. 
<clears throat> and your body has a hard time at, at making it anymore, um, that your body produces a very small amount of it afterwards. So, and by adding it into your body, you actually increase the, the amount of it. But then once you stop, and if you take it for a certain amount of time, um, your body gets used to it. And basically, it doesn't have to make it anymore because it's getting it from another source. So when you stop it, then your body has a much harder time at starting it back up again. So a lot of issues uh, you can have um, with using anabolic steroids. All right, uh, here are just uh, other ones. I think I think these are the ones that are are steroid hormones. I think the ones that, that are used. So just more again, you have the structures are all the same. Six six five ring system. Same here. Six 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 five. Um, these are ad adrenal steroids. These are not anabolic. So a, a lot of people think uh, that when they hear the word steroid, it's automatically assumed it's an anabolic steroid. And that's not true. We have a lot of steroids that are not considered anabolic. Um, uh, a anabolic is used for growing our muscles or growing parts of our body. Um, uh, Cholesterol is considered a steroid, but that, that has nothing to do with, with growing anything. These also, these adrenal sto uh, steroids don't have anything to do with anything. These, um, one issue uh, or one thing that uh, these are used are for inflammation in our body, like uh, cortisone and cortisol. Uh, these are used for inflammation. They have nothing to do with being an anabolic steroid. So. If you hear the word steroid, don't always assume it's anabolic steroids. Uh, steroids have a lot of uh, different things in our body. One of them is anabolic. Other one is cholesterol. And then the adrenal ones, um, like uh, prednisone. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of prednisone. Um, uh, if you have asthma, I know uh, my son has asthma. And there's one time his lungs were so bad, he actually had to take prednisone to actually bring down the inflammation inside of his lungs because they were so inflamed and it worked extremely well. Um, prednisone is one of these structures and it's also a steroid. It, it has a 6665 structure to it. I believe in the slides we talk about it a little bit later. It's not an anabolic steroid. A lot of people think, oh, it's a steroid. He's going to get all these big muscles and stuff, but it, it doesn't have that effect on the body. It has an anti-inflammatory effect um, on yeah, the body. Gosh. Yeah, sure. Um, if there's anabolic steroids, is there also catabolic steroids? Um, that's a good question. I don't know that offhand. I I don't think so. I don't think in catabolism. You know what? Why don't we just check? That's a good question. Catabolic steroids. Anabolic steroids are naturally or synthetic drugs. Anabolic, catabolic hormones. Oh, so all these, okay, so everything I'm talking about is a form of a catabolic steroid. Yeah, so yeah, they are. So it does the opposite, which would make sense. If you have an anti-inflammatory yeah. effect, it's actually, it's decreasing it. But, I, you know, I've never even heard that term um, as a catabolic steroid. Anabolic and catabolic in weight training. Yeah, it's building up anabolic, anabolic, catabolic, breaks down complex compounds in body tissue. Yeah, so I guess like, technically all those that break down, like prednisone, would be considered a catabolic. So including cortisol, adrenaline. Yeah, there you go. Yep, good question. I just learned something too. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so all these would technically be considered a catabolic. All right, so um, aldosterone uh, yeah, uh, regulates blood pressure and volume by controlling concentrations of sodium and potassium. Cortisone and cortisol serve as an anti-inflammatory agent. Um, and then prolonged use of steroids can have undesirable effects on bone loss and high blood pressure. Here you go. Prednisone or prednisolone. You might have heard both of those. Prednisolone, either without an L or, oh, 
one with an L. I'm going to pen here. Um, they are not quite the same thing, so pred, pred, is alone. It's actually pulp the structures. I don't think they have the structures in here. Uh, these are basically uh, synthetic alternatives um, and have uh, also an anti-inflammatory effect. Um, so, um, the, again, these are used. I know for um, the, uh, like currently, this is using quite a, uh, quite a lot as a treatment for a lot of the uh, coronavirus patients because of their lungs are getting filled with uh, all this fluid um, and causing pneumonia and, and it's having this um, inflammation effect in their lungs. So in, it, so in order to bring down the inflammation and to clear out um, uh, uh, all of the fluid, they, they are giving them uh, prednisone and prednisolone. Uh, as a treatment. It's, it's a common treatment in patients that have pneumonia. Um, and again, if anyone has asthma and has had a bad you know, effect on it and, and uh, you're having a hard time breathing and, and your inhalers aren't working at that point, that's kind of the last resort. Uh, so uh, I think, so there's prednisone and prednisolone. One is the precursor for the other. Uh, I can't remember. We can look it up pretty quick, um, but um, my computer's been typing really slow. Does I have all these uh, programs running at once? So here's the structure of prednisone. You can see again it's six, 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 five. All right, prednisolone. Uh, also, a 6665, uh, these are side by side comparison. That'd be great if these are both one. Yeah, it looks like it. So, uh, no, that's not. Put these alone. Oh, it's not important, but uh, it's basically it's the same type of thing. And one of them is the, pre the precursor. So, of course, prednisone. I think prednisone. Is the common one that's given. I don't know why you would choose one or the other. Again, that's a medical thing. Um, I don't know if one's more of a faster acting. Yeah, here we go. So, um, prednisone converts into prednisolone. So, uh, if people uh, prescribe prednisone, your body then converts it into prednisolone. So, it shows you that that's the active molecule. And basically, the, the only difference is going from a a ketone into an alcohol. So um, it's probably um, the prednisolone has a faster half-life is what I'm assuming. Again, this is based off of, you know, training I got from medicinal chemistry as to one why one, I mean, if it, this is the active one, why aren't we just using that one? It could be that when we take it orally, it has a much faster half-life. So by the time it gets into our body, half of it is already gone, has been all metabolized, where this might have a much slower half-life. So um, uh, it's much slower uh, in leaving our body, so you don't have to take as much of it. So that's usually why one would be over the other. Um, it could be age-related, that maybe the pregnancy alone is better for like children. Like a child's metabolism is much uh, different than an older, uh, than an adult metabolism. There are certain drugs that they would never give an adult, but they would give a child, um, and vice versa. There are drugs that they would never give a child, and they would give an adult or something. So these two are drugs, most common, prednisone, which converts into prednisolone in the body, um, and then that's the active form. All right, so if anyone's ever had to take that or use that, now you know what it is and what it does. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Um, and then um, fat soluble vitamins. Um, you know how they say that you can't ever overdose on vitamins. So you can take oh, as much vitamins as you want. And then if you guys ever um, urinated after like taking a multivitamin, you can kind of smell all the vitamins. That's from the uh, water soluble vitamins. The fat soluble vitamins, you can actually overdose on these. Um, because these don't get flushed out of your system. Um, and these actually absorb a lot better in the body. 
it's these water soluble ones. That a lot of people say, does a vitamin really matter? Are, are you know, are, are you really getting anything from it? Um, you might be getting a, a little bit from the water soluble one, but but the fat soluble ones are definitely absorbing a lot better in your body um, because you can't actually OD on them. Um, so uh, these are just kind of the four common ones: A, D, E, and K. As far as fat soluble, a lot of the other ones are water soluble, like vitamin C. Um, uh, I think all of the B's are water soluble, um, so you can't really OD on those. Uh, but these, if you take way too much, uh, that that could that could be a problem. All right, uh, let's do that. Okay, so vitamins are either water or fat soluble. The four fat solubles, A, D, E, K, found in fruits, vegetables, fish, liver, and dairy products. They are stored in adipose, so are fat cells and used as needed. Um, vitamin A is you uh, is found in liver, fish, and dairy products. It's made up of beta carotene. This is actually used in our vision. Um, you know, they say that if you, if you eat all your carrots, it's good for your eyesight. That's because there's a lot of the beta carotene in it. Um, let me go back. Let me get my pen here. Ah, whoa, that's a view of the number one. No, I got through that. So, beta pen, here we go. Beta carotene. All right. Um, beta carotene, the molecule is actually orange in color. Um, that's why that carrots are orange, because that orange color is all the beta carotene. Um, the reason how this works in vision is you notice there's a double bond, a single bond. So what beta carotene is, is another vitamin A molecule hooked on this side of it. I don't think they actually have a structure. It's actually, let me, pull up, let me show you. So it's the same molecule, identical, but hooked on the other side. Right. I don't know if you can. Oh, here. Yeah, I'll just show you here. So the, the slide, you can see how you have a, a, a six-membered ring followed by double bond, double bond, double bond, double bond, double bond, OH. So there's four double bonds. This is the six-member ring, double bond, double bond, double bond, double bond. And then you take the identical group and put it on the other side, double bond. So four double bonds in the ring again. If you slice this in half, you'll have two vitamin A molecules. All right, does that make sense? So what vitamin A is, is two of those, or what beta carotene is, is two vitamin A molecules hooked onto each other. So this is what's in carrots and other fruits and vegetables. Um, and then when you cleave it, so our bodies will take beta carotene and cleave it in half. Here's the, stru here's the structure of, of vitamin A, and it, it puts an alcohol at the end of it. Um, and then that's what's used in our bodies for our vision. And like I was saying, you have these alternating double bonds. How our vision works, or how, how light works, is, is that the electrons, anytime that you have a double bond, single, double bond, single, double bond, single, it allows electrons to actually travel across uh, all of these carbons. What, when you have a single bond, the electrons aren't, aren't able to travel across all the atoms. It's kind of stuck in the area. But also photons will do the same thing. And a photon is what light is. So what's happening is the photon is traveling back and forth across here. So the more vitamin A that you have in your eyeball, the more photons are able to actually travel back and forth into your eye, which thereby make you have a better vision. Um, so that's how it works, is basically the photons are traveling on those double bonds. Um, so that's what they say, that if you eat your carrots or anything that has high beta carotene in it, um, your vision w will improve. I don't know how much it improves, um, but um, that's basically, but we need vitamin A for our vision. It's not that it will improve, it's that, that you'll keep having vision, I guess. <laughs> So it is needed for vision and for healthy mucous membranes. Vitamin A causes night blindness and dry eyes and skin. So there you go. That's what vitamin A does and how it works with beta carotene. So beta carotene, basically two vitamin A's hooked to each other. Once our bodies cleave it, you now have vitamin A. 
Vitamin D, also another one for bones. Um, it is actually synthesized from cholesterol. You can kind of see, all right, you can kind of see a, a six-membered ring here, a six-membered ring here, and a five-membered ring here. And if you look, one, two, three, four, five, six. If this was hooked to here, you would have that six, 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 five ring system, which is basically um, a, uh, uh, a steroid molecule, like the shape of a steroid, but in this, in this case of cholesterol. All right, so we actually need cholesterol in order to make vitamin D. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Everyone keeps saying that cholesterol is bad for us. Well, we actually need it. It's very important that we get it. All right, um, so, you know, again, a lot of people are saying uh, um, a diet low in fats is actually very bad for you. We need fat for, for all this stuff, for vitamins, hormones, um, and things like that. So vitamin D can be attained from milk. Uh, it also helps re re regulate calcium and, and, and potassium. Um, you know how they say that that sunlight, you, you know, anytime it's like, I need to go in the sun because I, mean, I need more vitamin D. Like how in the world does sun make vitamin D? Well, the way that you break this ring, so if we have a 665, let's say we have a, our cholesterol molecule. I'm sure all of you have heard that. So... Like nowadays, it's more important since everyone's trapped indoors. It's important that you go outside and you get some sunlight for, for, for your vitamin D. What happens is when the sunlight hits a cholesterol molecule, it cleaves these bonds in half and it converts it into this. That's basically how this ring breaks is basically from ultraviolet rays. Okay, so again, you know, when people say I got to go outside to get my vitamin D, how do you get vitamin D from outside? Well, we have our cholesterol, but in order to convert our cholesterol into vitamin D, it, it's not an enzyme or a molecule inside of our body. It's actually sunlight. So we need ultraviolet rays in order to break these cholesterol molecules into vitamin D. So now you understand why it's important that we get sunlight um, to make our, our vitamin D. Um, rickets, I don't think I've, I don't know anyone in the past whatever years that's ever had rickets. Um, that really is a, a, a deficient vitamin D. Nowadays, a lot of food is, is fortified with vitamin D, but it's better in order to get it from a natural source, which again is going out in the sun. Um, but it's kind of a catch-22, right? If you go out in the sun too long, then you get skin cancer. So <laughs> you just can never win, can you? Um, so there you go, vitamin D. Any questions on vitamin D? It's kind of an important vitamin that no one really, a lot of people forget about. <clears throat> All right, here's vitamin E as an antioxidant, um, protecting unsaturated side chains and fatty acids from unwanted oxidations. Deficiency of causes numerous neurological problems, although it's rare. Yeah, I, you know, you don't really hear in the news about vitamin E uh, deficiencies or problems. It's mostly D. Um, even A, I don't think people really have a lot of A issues. Um, vitamin K regulates right, the clotting proteins. Yeah, so vitamin K is used for clotting. Um, when we are actually born, um, it's the time where we have the most vitamin K in our bodies. We have an extreme amount of, of vitamin K um, in our bodies as babies, um, as a newborn. Um, uh, just kind of an interesting thing interesting fact that I know. Um, so if you don't have enough of the vitamin K, then you can bleed out. So vitamin K obviously is an important one. Um, so I know that people that do have blood clotting issues are usually have to take a vitamin K pill or they actually get an intravenous amount of vitamin K just to make sure that they have enough of it. All right, so any questions on vitamins, fat-soluble vitamins? Okay, um, last one, I think I think this is the last part of the slides, is prostaglandins and leukotrienes. They are types um, of these iconsinides. Again, I have a hard time pronouncing it. Um, they uh, are, let's see, potent which are certain cells synthesized. Um, they are local mediators rather than the hormone floating through our bodies. Uh, these, yeah, so these are a type of, of prostaglandin. If you see this structure, very common to um, 
across the glandin where you have a five membered ring. All right, and you have two alcohols, and then you have these groups hanging off of it, which are carbon, somewhere between, I don't know, uh, like six to 12, like somewhere around there. All right, usually they also have a carboxylic acid group. Uh, they are also re responsible for inflammation in the body. Aspirin and ibuprofen actually block this. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this in the news. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to relate a lot of this back to what we're learning or what's happening in the world. They said that if you have the coronavirus, that they're saying that aspirin and ibuprofen are not good for you, that you should actually be using Tylenol, that you don't want the anti-inflammatory effect. Um, they're saying that having the anti-inflammatory effect uh, in your body is actually is causing issues uh, for the patients who do have COVID-19, that you want to take Tylenol that reduces your, your fever and your achy joints but you don't want to have the anti-inflammatory effect. I don't know what the reason is exactly, <clears throat> but um, that's been kind of within the past two or three days, I've seen uh, a lot of postings about that, that they're finding that people who are taking Tylenol are doing better than the ones who are taking aspirin or ibuprofen. Um, so if you guys want to look that up, and again, it's because aspirin and ibuprofen have an anti-inflammatory effect where Tylenol does not have an anti-inflammatory effect. It just has a pain-killing effect and it reduces um, our temperatures as well. So kind of an interesting read. I haven't had a chance like, to read what the mode of action is, but kind of related to what we're talking about. Uh, prostaglandins will decrease gas ex secretion, inhibit blood platelet aggregation, stimulate uterine contractions, and relax smooth muscle. Um, yeah, there are two types. There's a COX-1 and a COX-2. Um, Depending on the drug, it inhibits one of these. It either inhibits the COX-1 and COX-2. One of them happens to do with um, uh, our stomach acid. I believe it talks about all in here. So the, co the COX-1 is involved in the usual production of, of, pros of prostaglandins. COX-2 is responsible for the additional prostaglandin. Um, uh, uh, for the additional prostaglandins in inflammation like arthritis. So depending on the drug, you want to inhibit one or the other, but not both of them. So NSAIDs, which are non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, that's like ibuprofen and aspirin. Um, they in, uh, inhibit COX-1 um, and in COX-2, uh, but they increase the formation of stomach ulcers because it increases the amount of stomach acid. Uh, but then there's other drugs um, that only block uh, the COX-2 enzyme, and they don't affect our stomach acid. It's kind of used more for people who have arthritis. <clears throat> and I believe that's it. That's the last slide. Any questions? I do have a question about our one. Okay. Uh, just which one do you think is more likely that we'll end up with well or um, um, I have no idea. I can't answer that. Uh, okay. It just all depends on time. Um, I mean, as of right now, I have the actual exam written, so I do have the hard copy uh, that I can post on D2L. I, I just would have to make the other one. Um, again, it just all depends on time. I don't know how how the week will go. Um, yeah. Uh, will Will there be an issue either way? I mean, if if you're able to do the hard copy, but you can't do the online one, I have no problem. I have no problem in giving you the hard copy. Uh, but if you think that there might be a problem in doing it the online, then that's no problem. I can just give you the hard copy. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I will have to upload it. Um, and I know you wanted to keep our scanner. Uh, I'm sorry. Process to get my scanner to work. So. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying, the scanner. Well, oh, oh, I actually wanted to show you this. I'm glad you actually said that. Um, I uh, Did I post it with you guys? Oh, I just got logged out because it's been too long. Uh, let me, I think I posted this. There, if you have a phone, a cell phone, doesn't matter if it's an iPhone or a Android. Let me see if I posted these. Oh, I didn't post it. So um, there's a way 
you don't actually have to upload a program. You, your phones actually have the ability. Uh, let me actually pull it up in a different. I know I posted it in these other things. Your phone has the ability of of converting a photo into a PDF. So if you don't have a scanner, uh, let's see where is it? It's right here. How to scan. I'll, uh, I'll post these for you guys. Let me actually open this. So I, I don't remember if I talked about this last week. Did, did I talk about this last week, how you can get a program that can scan in, that you, you can take a photo? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, I thought I did. Um, this is actually on every phone. Uh, so you don't actually have to download a program. You actually have the ability of doing this even if you did not download a program. So let me post this in our room. I can tell that a lot of people are on D2L because things are loading very slowly. I mean, it's not incredibly slow, but like by now, I would have a page. I can tell it's, it's going a little slower. So what you can do is you don't have to have to print out the exam per se. Um, you can just write on a piece of paper the answers, and then you can take a picture of it with your phone, um, and then you can, and then you use one of these uh, programs, all depending on the type of phone you have, um, and convert it into a PDF, and then upload it. I hope that makes sense. Let me post these so we have. Uh... Would it also be alright for us to just? Our answers in Word and then oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm totally fine with that. Um, I'm just trying to trying to make it with the least amount of steps for, for you guys as possible, but if that's easier to do, I'm totally fine with that. All right, cool. Yeah. yeah. Everything works. It's just obviously um, getting the immediate feedback from the online exam would be nice. Right. But either works. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would like to because it, you know, you know, save me time for grading. But for, you know, for, for me, it's the same amount of time if I make the exam or if I grade the exam because making it is. Uh, uh, I'll just, I'll just do this. I think this is to the Android. Uh, yeah, no, I totally understand. But, you know, as you can imagine, I got lots to do. Plus, you know, I have my two kids. I have to make sure that they're doing all their stuff. You can imagine they're like, oh, we're home from school. I don't have to do school. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, no, that's not good. Okay, there we go. Okay, good. Any other questions? I'm going to guess, I'm going to say most likely it will be a hard copy that you'll download or that you'll open up. And you'll write on a piece of paper, and then you can, or you know, you, you can type it in into Word, uh, and then you can upload it. Because I have that already done. I have that available. So if you know, so I, you know, as of right now, I have that available. It's just a matter of if I can find time to actually do it in D2L, because D2L is not very user friendly in order to uh, in order to make exams. So. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. And it's probably going to be, I'm going to guess, about 50 to 60 questions, multiple choice and true and false questions um, is basically how it's going to be. Um, it's, it's hard to draw stuff and then do that, so pretty much it's going to be a multiple choice exam. All right. I'm cool with multiple choice. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> And again, you can have all your open notes and stuff. I just say, I just ask that that you just don't use Google. And like I said, I'll have the, you'll have the videos on you and the sound. You know, my glasses reflect my screen when I have a webcam on. <laughs> okay. All right. Anything else? Do, do you guys want me to go over the other two chapters, or do you guys feel okay? If you guys feel okay, we can just call it a day. Unless you guys have other questions, or if you want me to go over everything else again, or um, I kind of leave it up to you guys. That's pretty good, especially with the, we have a week until the exam. So. Right. Okay. 
Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm fine if you leave, but if there's someone else has other questions or want me to go over anything, I'll be more than happy to. I just have an individual question, but I was just going to wait till the end. Until the, um, well, I mean, if it's okay, it might be a question that another person has, if you're okay. Well, um, for the email I sent you a few weeks ago when I was sick, right. I had um, my lab uploaded with that email. Oh, okay. But never got Rated. It got oh. graded as a zero. So okay. That was, okay. So I'll tell you what. Just to yeah, it. it probably got lost in my emails because I'm getting so many. Why don't you upload it into the activities area? So here, um, so that I know it's there. So upload it into, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make a new category for labs. So if anybody hasn't turned in any post labs or anything, this is your chance. I'm giving you this week to upload the rest of your labs and I'll give you grades for it. Okay. Does that make sense? So th this way it's here, and I know exactly wh where it is. Okay? Okay. Are you, are you able to do that? Yes, able, thank okay. you. Yep, yep, yeah, thanks for letting me know. Um, I get, I've been getting like, I don't know, 50 emails a day from the president, from other students, from instructors. So anything from a week ago is, is gone. <laughs> I apologize. But uh, yeah, if you want to upload that, I'll give you full credit for that. Is it on this Monday or Monday after next? What's that? Like this upcoming Monday? For what? Next, uh, this class. Is it going to be our review day or is that exam day? So next Monday, a week from today, is your exam. Okay. Yeah, this is the re review. So I was I was asking you guys. Do you want to do a review, or do you guys feel comfortable? Um, it's entirely up to you guys. I mean, as far as review, all I'm going to do is go over the slides again. Um, so so if you guys feel comfortable with it, then there's no reason like to do it. But if you, if you want me to do it, I have no problem in doing it. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I'm comfortable. Okay, good. Does, any, does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, we, we can call it a day. See everyone have their have their mics off, so I guess that uh, we can call it a day. Okay. If, uh, yep. Uh, yeah. Feel free to ask me questions all throughout the week if you guys are studying. Um, if you guys want to have office hours, basically how we would do office hours is find a time, um, and we would just go on w w w w WebEx exactly how we're doing now, and uh, you know I have a pen and pad and I can explain stuff. So if you guys want to do that, I'm more than happy to do that at any time. Um, just kind of give me a heads up. Um, Fridays are usually pretty good. I mean, nowadays I'm whole, home all the time. So, you know, if it's like eight o'clock at night or something and I'm not busy or doing something and you're, you know, I'm around, I've, I've no problem, um, in helping you out. Um, so I'll throw that out there. All right. Okay. If that's the case. I will see you guys next Monday at 10 o'clock. Have a good day. Okay. Yep. Yeah, you too. Bye, guys.